Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the internal anatomy of the respiratory tract. So this is primarily going to be just an anatomy video. Uh, in various places, we might discuss some basic functions, but generally, it's just going to be anatomy. So first, let's begin with the most superior part of the respiratory tract. And in general, it's all this up here. This is the nasal cavity. So you can kind of tell right here, this is, of course, the nose. We're looking at a mid-sagittal section here. So here's our nasal cavity. Now, this entire nasal cavity is just a space, but it has some important features in it and surrounding it. First of all, right here, we have the external nostril or the external nair. Now, generally, when we refer to nostrils, we usually just think of those two little holes in our nose, right? But actually, there is a set of internal nostrils, which we'll discuss in a couple minutes. So this nostril right here, which is also called a nair, this would be the external nostril or external nair. And of course, when you inhale through your nose, this would be the entrance point of that air. These concha are really these sort of bulges that sit above these grooves. So each one of these concha actually has a corresponding groove, which are actually called meatuses. Okay, so this top one, this top bulge, is called the superior concha. This one right here, this would be the middle concha. And this one down here would be the inferior concha. Now, if you look beneath each of the concha, there's a corresponding meatus that's not labeled here. So the one beneath the superior concha is aptly named the superior meatus. The one beneath this middle concha, this groove, would be the middle meatus. And then the meatus below the inferior concha is the inferior meatus. And collectively, these concha, what they serve to do is anytime you inhale through the nose, they help to warm and humidify the before the air actually goes further into the respiratory tract. Okay? Now, back here, uh, this thing right here, this little uh, gateway, I guess you could call it, uh, this is actually labeled as the posterior nasal aperture. Now, this sort of space or gateway right here, it's labeled the posterior nasal aperture. Really, in general, this is where the internal nair is, or the internal nostril. So recall I said we have external nostril or external nair, okay, and of course we have two of those. Well, we've got an internal nostril. Okay, So pretty much the internal nostril or internal nair is just a space where the air would have to travel during inhalation to go further into the respiratory tract. Um, it's really nothing more than just an anatomical landmark. All right. Now, if you're inhaling air through the nose, it's of course going to go through the external nostrils. It's going to be warmed and humidified by these concha and then go through the internal nostrils. And then it's going to enter a structure that pretty much spans this whole distance called the pharynx. All right. Now, what's important to note also is that if you were to inhale air through the mouth, of course you can do that. The air is going to travel here and it's also going to enter the pharynx. Okay? However, depending on how you inhale the air, whether it's through the nose or through the mouth, it's going to enter a different region of the pharynx. So that leads us to the three regions of the pharynx. We have the superior part, which is the nasopharynx, the middle part, which is the oropharynx, and the most inferior is the laryngopharynx. All right. So the top part right here, really this is just the section of the pharynx that lies behind the internal nostril, or really behind the whole nasal cavity. This is the nasopharynx, because it's behind the nasal cavity. Okay, So here's the nasopharynx. Once you get kind of past the uvula right here, and you get to the region behind the oral cavity, this region of the pharynx is called the oropharynx. Oro for oral. It's behind the oral cavity. So when you inhale air through your nose, that air has to go through the nasopharynx and then down. Whereas if you inhale air through your mouth, then that air bypasses the nasopharynx and goes directly to the oropharynx and then downwards. But regardless, during inhalation, regardless of where the air is entering your body, from the oropharynx, it will descend downward into the laryngopharynx. And the laryngopharynx is the most inferior part of this, and it's named that way because it lies adjacent to the larynx. But in general, the laryngopharynx is going to lie adjacent to the larynx. Now, I want to take this opportunity to discuss something really important. Okay? It wouldn't matter if it's air or if it's something we swallow, like 
or fluid or food or something like that, that stuff is going to descend downwards. Now, that substance, whatever it happens to be, has two options of where to go. Okay? It can either go through this passageway, this more anterior passageway, which happens to be the respiratory tract, or it can stay going down this direction, in which case this is the digestive tract. So actually, once we get past the laryngopharynx, there's actually two passageways, and the body somehow has to decide which one of those it's going to take. It can go through the anterior one, which is the respiratory tract, or the posterior one, which is the esophagus, or digestive tract. Okay? And we'll see on a different slide that there's a way that this is actually controlled. One thing I will mention about the esophagus is the esophagus by nature, if you're not swallowing or you're not eating, the esophagus is actually compacted. Okay? It's not actually open like this. The reason they open the esophagus is so you can actually see it. But actually at rest while you're not swallowing, this thing is actually closed and packed. Okay? In contrast, this part of the respiratory tract down here, which is the trachea, okay, the trachea lies beneath the larynx. The trachea has to remain open at all times, and the same thing is true of the larynx. You don't want any part of the respiratory tract actually closing, because that would be very bad. You wouldn't be able to breathe. So in other words, we're going to have to have something, and we'll see in a minute what it is, that keeps the respiratory tract permanently open. And when we say open, sometimes we refer to that as being patent. P-A-T-E-N-T, -E patent. So hopefully all of this makes sense to you. And of course, there's some other pieces here that are a little bit less important, and we're going to skip over those. But what I want to do now is actually take a look at the larynx. And what we're going to do is we're actually, instead of looking at a mid-sagittal section, we're actually going to take an anterior view. So we're going to look directly in front of the person. So this would be like if you are just facing somebody, they're facing you, and you're looking directly at their neck. This is an anterior view. Okay. Pretty much all this on the top, this is the larynx. The trachea is, of course, below that. The trachea is really also called the windpipe, so it actually has the shape of a pipe. But let's talk about the larynx first. And the first structure we're going to talk about, which is a little bit actually above the larynx region, but still important, is called the epiglottis. Okay. The epiglottis is important because it controls entry of matter, so food, drink, air, into the digestive system, or the respiratory system. So if we go back and look at this picture right here, remember that I said somehow the body is going to have to make a decision as that matter is traveling down the pharynx, whether it continues into the digestive tract, which is the esophagus right here, or enters into the respiratory tract. If it's just air, that's really easy. Okay? The air is not going to have to force anything open like the esophagus. The air is simply going to travel through the respiratory tract, through the larynx, through the trachea, and downward. If you're exhaling, it's just going to go the opposite direction. But we're talking about inhalation. So air is just going to travel down, and it has no problem going into the larynx and trachea. And it has no problem because, first of all, it's just air. But second of all, these respiratory tracts right here are held patent. They're held open. We'll talk about why that is in a couple minutes. Right? Now, if you have food, you obviously don't want food going down into your respiratory tract. Okay? You want food going down the posterior digestive tract. And so when food is coming in here through the oral cavity right here into the oral pharynx, it's actually going to push the epiglottis down. And actually when you swallow, there's also a reflex that actually forces this epiglottis down. Now this epiglottis is like a flap. Okay? So think about it. If this epiglottis folds down, it's going to fold down over the opening of the respiratory tract. So that way when food comes down here, the food has no ability to go down the larynx and trachea. It can only go down the esophagus. Okay? And we're going to discuss that more when we look at the digestive system. But understand this, when you swallow, which is voluntary of course, that's actually going to help force the epiglottis down. In addition, the food as it's moving down can actually push the epiglottis down as well, and it covers the opening of the respiratory tract. Uh, the reason people choke oftentimes is, you know, if you're eating something and somebody says something funny and you laugh, you're kind of inhaling a little bit and you're not actually swallowing. So you're not actually getting that epiglottis to close fully. And that's why when you're laughing while you got food in your mouth or it's in the back of your mouth or something, you can actually accidentally get food into the respiratory tract because you didn't actually get that epiglottis to fold down. Okay. 
Now this is called the epiglottis. Epi means above. So kind of this region right below the epiglottis, this region of the larynx, this is actually what's called the glottis. Okay? So the glottis is important because the glottis has what are called vocal folds. These are actually the vocal cords that actually allow you to produce speech, or they at least assist in producing speech. Um, so this right here would be a vocal fold, okay? And this would be located in the glottis region, which I didn't have labeled, okay? Now that stuff is pretty much all up here, okay? And technically all of this really is the larynx, um, and so, some people will actually consider this the glottis region, but the whole thing up here is really the larynx. Now, as air is descending during inhalation through this region, through the epiglottis, through the glottis, through the major part of the larynx, it's eventually going to go into this pipe right here called the trachea. Now, notice that the trachea is going to pretty much have a constant diameter over its entire length downwards. And also, the trachea is quite a bit thinner than the larynx. Okay, So notice that. Okay. Um, while the larynx really is the initial entryway of air into the respiratory tract, the trachea is really important because as it will descend downward, and we'll see in the next video, it'll actually lead into what we call the respiratory tree. Okay? So it leads into what we call primary bronchi, and this is actually what leads into the lungs themselves. So we're not actually at the lungs. What's also important about this region is there's several pieces of membranes and cartilage that you'll often need to know for an anatomy course. Right. So first of all, right around the region where we have the epiglottis, we have this bone called the hyoid bone. Okay. Um, I'll just go ahead and mention this. The hyoid bone appears to have some spikes on them. These little spikes that are more medial are called a lesser komu, and the one over here is called a greater komu. Now the hyoid bone is a floating bone, uh, and it does not articulate with any other bone, but it is important for speech production. Okay. Now, if we go beneath the hyoid bone right here, we have this large membrane called a thyrohyoid ligament. Okay? Now, this is just pointing to the middle part. This is the extrinsic part. But the whole thing here that goes across this entire length is the thyrohyoid ligament. The reason it's called that is because, first of all, it's beneath the hyoid bone. That's where the hyoid part comes from. And it's above the thyroid cartilage, so thyrohyoid ligament. Now this right here is the thyroid cartilage. This is the largest piece of cartilage that we actually have um, in the larynx region, because there's a lot of cartilages here in the larynx and trachea regions. So this is the largest one. This is the thyroid cartilage. Now this thyroid cartilage, you might think, well, maybe it covers the thyroid. It actually does not cover the thyroid. It actually sits above the thyroid. The thyroid gland itself is actually down here on the trachea right beneath the cricoid cartilage. Okay? So the thyroid cartilage does not cover the thyroid. The thyroid actually sits beneath the cricoid cartilage. Okay? But this is your thyroid cartilage. And this thing right here called the laryngeal prominence, this is actually what we commonly call the Adam's apple, which of course is more prominent in men because they have a higher amount of testosterone, which actually increases the size of the laryngeal prominence. All right? Now, situated right below the thyroid cartilage, we have this intermediate sized cartilage called the cricoid cartilage. And also, right between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, we have the cricothyroid ligament, also called the cricothyroid membrane. Okay? And it's called that because it's between the cricoid cartilage, so crico and thyroid cartilage, thyroid. Okay? So it's right between them. Beneath this, we have the trachea. Now, on the trachea, we have ringed cartilage, okay, these rings, and these rings are called tracheal cartilage. These tracheal cartilages do not go around the entire circumference, and they actually terminate somewhere on the back side of the trachea, but in general, all of them actually serve to keep the trachea patent, to keep it open. The trachea can never close. If it collapses or closes, you will not be able to breathe and you will suffocate. So these cartilages help keep the trachea open at all times, and in general, these other cartilages actually help to keep the larynx open at all times. Okay? They actually assist in that as well. Between each of the tracheal cartilages, so here's our first two right here, uh, these ligaments right here are actually called annular ligaments. Okay? So there's actually annular ligaments, different sets of them between two different sets of tracheal cartilages as you go down. So here's a set of annular ligaments, here's another set, and here's another set. Then we also have a cricotracheal ligament, and you'll notice a lot of these are named pretty intuitively. 
it's between the cricoid cartilage and the first tracheal cartilage. So it's a cricotracheal ligament or cricotracheal membrane. All right. Now, there's one other thing I wanted to mention about thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage. Um, it's not that they're involved in speech production necessarily, but there's something that we can observe that's a consequence of speech production, rather the pitch of the speech production. So pitch really just describes the note. You know, for example, you can raise the pitch of your voice. That just means you're singing a high note or singing a low note, right? We've got some people that do soprano, some people are baritones, right? So different pitches, right? So it turns out that if you actually change the pitch of your voice, what you can actually feel is the thyroid cartilage actually changes its angle relative to the cricoid cartilage. So what you should do is, and it's easier if you're a guy to do this because we have larger uh, Adam's apples or laryngeal prominences, what you should do is put one of your fingers or a couple fingers on your Adam's apple. And then just kind of, don't take your fingers off of the Adam's apple, but just kind of very slightly move your finger or fingers down just a little bit, okay? And I'm not going to do this out loud because I'm going to royally embarrass myself, but basically if you sing a note and then change the pitch, what you'll actually feel is the thyroid cartilage actually moving relative to the cricoid cartilage. And I challenge you to do that, but you should actually feel a slight angle change. And you can go up pretty high or pretty low, and uh, you'll be able to feel that. Just don't wake your neighbors. Um, but in any case, this is the external anatomy of the larynx and trachea. Okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of all the internal anatomy and external anatomy of the upper respiratory tract. In the next video, we're going to discuss the lower respiratory tract, which really just involves the lungs. And we're going to see how we can go from the trachea to increasing the surface area a million times over. Right? Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.